Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Southern Outdoorsman Podcast. Today, we got a special one for you that I'm really excited about. Uh, we're talking about understanding buck movement. Uh, this is a recent, I guess, paper study that was put out by the Mississippi State University Extension. Uh, how, when, and why bucks navigate the landscape. This is a big GPS study that we're going to be going over today. They recently put it out. It's free. You can go read it. It's like 20 pages. It's a pretty quick read, a uh, pretty easy read. They did a really good job of boiling everything down into layman's terms, and uh, I'll link it in the description. So if you want to go read it for yourself, kind of follow along as we're going, you can go do that. Uh, but we're going to be going over it here, and of course, we've got the video version of the podcast going, so there's like some graphs and charts and maps and stuff in here that you're going to be able to see on the video version if you're listening into this on the audio feed, but I'm excited. I'm very excited. This is fun stuff, man. Mm -hmm. Jacob, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing well. I'm interested in getting some of this data here. Again, big advantage, guys, to go over to YouTube and actually watch this video version of the podcast. And if you're already watching on YouTube, uh, then you don't have to go anywhere. You're here. So, um, <laughs> but home. Yeah, but I'm real interested because I personally haven't read the paper. You have. Yeah. So it's going to be kind of interesting getting your take on it uh, since you've kind of gone over everything and then I can kind of, you know, free flow at the top of my head some different thoughts so yeah we're we're gonna be just kind of going through and hitting some high points we're gonna leave a lot of stuff out uh just because it's 20 pages and i'm not gonna read 20 pages on the podcast uh i don't think anyone would want to hear that but we are gonna go through and kind of hit some of the high points because there's some there's some really interesting stuff in here from from like the moon phase they take a couple shots at, at moon phase people in here which i kind of like <laughs> but anyways so it's gonna get a little spicy we're gonna get some comments uh, and and then hunting pressure, uh, so it, it kind of goes into habitat, uh, buck bedding, how hunting pressure affects those two things, how the rut affects those things, moon phase, all that good stuff. So, all right, so yeah, it's called Understanding Buck Movement, How, When, and Why Bucks Navigate the Landscape. Uh, pretty interesting stuff here. So uh, just starting out, like kind of setting the stage, they're talking about uh, basically – an intro for the study, like how, how a deer's brain works and whatnot. So like, I'm just going to like kind of fire off some of this stuff real quick. Uh, it says the human brain has a high capacity for complex reasoning, but a white tailed deer brain is wired for enhanced sensory perception. However, deer move for essentially the same reasons we do to safely find food, water, and shelter. Most deer behavioral decisions are driven by physiological processes related to survival, hunger, and reproduction and are influenced by food availability and cover. So um, I think that was just like a pretty fancy way of saying, kind of like what Josh Driver said in his episode, I keep referring back to that, is like the deer are subconsciously reacting mm -hmm. to stuff. Like they, they don't think logically. Um, and they even have like a little little graph in here that's thinking like a deer or a little, little graphic. And it, it's like a thought bubble above the deer. And it says, today I must get food. And here are my options for foraging areas. Some areas are nutrient rich, some are nutrient poor, some are far away, some are close, some have risk from predators, some don't. Okay, so those are your options. Some of them are dangerous, some of them are close, some of them are, are nutrient rich, some of them are, are terrible. Um, and then it, it, it kind of has like this other little graph that says that obviously they're wanting to maximize nutrient quality and energy gain. So they're trying to eat the best food they can mm -hmm. with expending the least amount of uh, energy that they can. So they, they want to go have a nice dinner, but they don't want to spend that much money. You know what I'm talking about? And then predation risk. They want to minimize predation risk and energy costs. So they, do, they don't want to drive to the bad part of town and get dinner over there, you know, <laughs> and they don't want to spend a lot of gas doing it. Yeah. So it, it's really that simple. Um, and, and so I, I don't know, I kind of think back on areas that I've hunted in the past and areas that are really good. And I think some of the pine thickets that we've been hunting lately like where your brother just had success kind of relate to this there and, and that's going to come in later but initially just like what is your kind of overall thought on, on that yeah i mean it makes sense i mean this is a conversation that's been discussed on this podcast before that deer aren't as complex as a lot of people make them out to be um and they're not you know actively thinking I should bed here because I can watch this parking lot and watch honey yeah. pressure. It's more Cause, like cause Jacob's going to be here at three o'clock. Yeah, I? absolutely. Yeah. So it, it's more so just, you know, they are focusing around everything they're doing based around, you know, these resources when it comes to food, you know, a little bit of water, but really food predation uh, with like security cover all in mind. So, you know, if, if they're using the area that they haven't been harassed in before by coyotes, you know, hunters, maybe black bears, all that kind of stuff, 
they're going to stay in those areas until it yeah. forces them to maybe you know adjust their position. Um, but it's not like they're necessarily going to go out of their way to go do anything specifically uh, in between um, all the different other you know movement time periods. So um, it, it's again pretty basic understanding. But again, this study is going to give us a lot more intel on specifically what these researchers have found. And I'm really interested in kind of seeing the movement and how that kind of played a factor, especially with like hunting pressure and everything else. Uh, because that's something we discussed about a lot before, which is the whole idea on, you know, whether or not, you know, how, or how much does hunting pressure affect overall deer movement in certain mm -hmm. areas? Um, because we've, we've talked to a bunch of individuals who said, um, you know, if you can, like say here in Alabama on some of our pieces of public land, if you have three days to go gun hunt a specific property and a bunch of hunters flow in, and then after that gun hunt, you know, kind of, you know, probably stifles movement or is that the right stifles word? Stifles them. movement. There you go. Um, <laughs> You're close. And then the next, you know, couple days afterwards, they're kind of recovering. They're not running into people. They're not running into other hunters and or as they would, you know, as deer would imagine as a predator. Yeah. And then movement kind of goes back to normal and you can catch them in areas that you wouldn't have seen them more than likely, yeah. you know, on one of those gun hunts when all that pressure was extremely high. Yeah. They, they actually, there's a big section in here about that and it's really interesting. So we're going to get to it. Uh, deer may also venture outside their normal area by searching, um, searching for new uh, sources of food or breeding opportunities. These short-term movements outside their area are called excursions. People also go on excursions, but we call them vacations or trips. Vacations are, what the hell is that word? Anagal, anagalus? An, anal, how do you say that? Man, you done bit off more than we could do. You, you try to say it. No, I'm good. Just say, what? Sound it out. <laughs> okay, maybe don't sound it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh god! Yeah, I don't know if I want to send out that word. All right, yeah, that one. just because it could come off a little inappropriate, guys. If you're watching on the YouTube, you, <laughs> you, you, you. all right. Anyway, golly, just totally threw myself off. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, deer excursions can last for a, a day or several days and span several miles. Excursion events happen more often during the breeding season. So some of our movements are more likely uh, tied to mate search behavior. That said, excursions can also take place during the spring, summer. So not all excursions are related to breeding. So that's going to come, I hit on that because that's going to come in later, uh, talking about home ranges and how big some of these deer's home ranges are. Mm -hmm. And that, that to me is probably like one of the more interesting things in here. Uh, and then, and then they talk a little bit about their study area. So this took place in Mississippi. I think it was the Big Black River area of Mississippi. It was over a 50,000-acre study area. Uh, it's all privately held, and all the landowners in here basically are, are deer hunters, so they're managing. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a big co-op. They're all managing for, uh, like, trophy bucks. They all got food plots. Uh, but it's kind of some of the main components of it are upland hardwoods, bottomland hardwoods, food plots, pine forest, and herbaceous. Herbaceous would be like uh, old field mm -hmm. kind of habitat. Uh, so pretty pretty similar to what most people across the southeast hunt. Like if you if you hunt in the southeast, you hunt either all of those things or, or at least one of them, like the bottomland hardwoods, upland hardwoods, pine forest, herbaceous. Like that's super common across pretty much everywhere that we hunt mm -hmm. in the southeast. Uh, so super relatable. Um, all landowners within the 50,000 acre study area shared the goal of producing older bucks for recreational harvest with an adult sex ratio of one buck to one to two does within our study area. A hunter harvest was the leading cause of mortality in adult bucks, but other causes include vehicle uh, collision, EHD, and poaching. The annual survival rate ranged from 60 to 75%. That's kind of interesting to me because I kind of wonder about if this is like a, this by all means sounds like a pretty well managed giant chunk of land mm -hmm. where all these landowners are on the same page, they're passing probably three and a half year old bucks, and the survival rate's still 60 to 75%. Mm -hmm. I'm like, dang, what is it on, you know, our local WMA over here? You know, that's well, that's why you don't have very many older bucks. I saw someone highlight a study, and it might be part of this study or it might be a different study, um, talking about like there is in some areas of the country, there's upwards of like 35%. Uh, natural kill off of mature bucks or just adult bucks. I, th I wonder what they classify as adult bucks. Is it two and a half year old, three year old deer? I don't know. Um, but anyways, it had, they had a natural die off of between 30 and 35% in most, in, in some areas of the study area um, due to uh, bre breeding related causes where they got too run down. They couldn't, you know, find a forage after the fact oh. and they died from sickness, illness, um, but also died from uh, buck fights um and and that kind of aspect like taking the hunter 
you know, the hunter side out of the equation, the so hunter that, mortality. Yeah. Um, and Interesting. If, if that's the case, like, you know, you're talking about a significant number of those deer potentially die from natural causes outside of, you know, yeah. hunter harvests. And, you know, yeah. even deal with, you know, private coyotes and everything else. Because I think a lot that they had talked about in that specific study was just a lot of it are built around the breeding application of, uh, you know, the cause of death. Yeah, I mean, and that, and that goes to show, like, you know, if you have a hundred two and a half year old bucks at next year, I mean, probably only about 60 of them are going to make it, you know, on most places. And then the year after that, you've only got 60 of them. And then probably between 50 to on the high end, like 70% of them are going to live. Mm -hmm. And so you can see how it just gets whittled down. So by the time you get to that six and a half year old age class, there's a handful of them. Yeah. There's not, there's not very many at all. Uh, a little bit more about the GPS that they used. Uh, our callers recorded a GPS location every 15 minutes from September 1st to February 28th and every four hours from March 1st to August 31st. So pretty detailed during the hunting season. This is kind of similar to other GPS studies that we've looked at. Uh, they're recording a location every 15 minutes, so it pings that, that deer's location 15 minutes during hunting season and for uh, four hours outside of hunting season, essentially. Oh, this is an interesting bit, this next bit. You didn't highlight that part, but that yeah. kind of goes into this. So, all right. Bucks are always moving, but their daily distance increased from 4,000 yards from October to November to over 6,000 yards from December to January. Which in this area more than likely is during the rut yes. time period. So the rut time period is December, January. So, but I'm I'm just saying early season they're still moving four thousand yards a day. Okay, I mean, well, per for every twenty four hour period. So yeah, how much of that? How much of that is at night? It, versus daylight, absolutely. Um, these monthly changes make sense because some of the most breeding activity because the most breeding activity takes place from mid December to mid January. And finding receptive does is a motivating force behind buck movements during this time. This, and, and they got some graphs that kind of clearly, clearly demonstrate that uh, total daily distance traveled, and it got, it gets up pretty freaking high. Yeah, seventy five hundred yards. The the timing of the breeding season varies dramatically across Mississippi and much of the southeast. And our study area peak rut during which fifty percent of does are bred occurs over two weeks from December twenty fifth to January seventh. Another 40% of breeding is split between the two weeks before the peak rut and after the peak rut. So do uh, you want to kind of explain that a little bit more? Yeah, so the rut is like a bell curve. And we've had uh, different biologists talk about this on the podcast. Uh, Dr. Um, uh, Mike Chamberlain, I almost, yep. almost said Taylor Chamberlain. <laughs> which He's not a biologist, but he kills a lot of deer up in Virginia. <laughs> um, but uh, Dr. Mike Chamberlain had talked about this, and, and other guys as well have been on the show where that – that rut bell curve, it, it just it, – the best way to describe, if you think of a bell curve and how it kind of rolls up and rolls back down, as it starts to go up, you have a few does starting to come into, uh, to come into heat and be receptive. Because of that, typically from a hunting standpoint, what we've seen is – I'm going to take this out of the study aspect. You see an excess of movement or a lot more buck movement, especially as you're starting going up that bell curve before the, it actually plateaus at the very top because they're trying to search for those first few hot does that are coming in, which they're saying this study is roughly, you know, 20% of those deer are getting bred on the upper end of the bell curve. Yep. And 20% roughly on the back end of the bell curve. Mm -hmm. And at those parts of the rut, the early part of the rut and the later part of the rut, uh, that's where you can see a lot more excess movement. You see a lot of guys talk about this if they're hunting the Midwest, you know, hunting from like October, you know, 25th to November, the first, second, third, fourth. And that's kind of that upper, you know, that's as that bell curve starting to go up, see a lot of movement then. And then it kind of plateaus out because there's so many does coming to heat. Bucks really don't have to travel. So if you're not on a specific hot doe that has a specific, you know, buck on it, especially a mature buck you're trying to harvest, um, you might not see a whole bunch of movement at that time period. And then on the back end of that bell curve, as it starts going back down and there's less and less does in heat, you see a spike of movement. And you hear a lot of guys in the Midwest talk about this, that a lot of times from like November 17th through 25th of November, when a lot of people are kind of probably back out of the woods and aren't hunting anymore, it can be extremely good time to hunt just because there's less does in heat. There's still some coming into heat, but those mature bucks have to travel a lot more in order to find those deer, which gives you a better hunting opportunity. 
Yeah. Uh, and we've definitely seen that down here. Like one of the areas that we'll be hunting probably going in next week, which I don't know when this episode will come out, but going to next week is that upper edge of that bell curve. It's starting to rise up. We're starting to see a ton of activity. Yep. Uh, bucks on doe groups and stuff like that. You're starting to see does with a lot more darker tarsal glands. Um, and the bucks are just wearing out scrapes. And that's an awesome time period in order to kind of go and capitalize trying to kill a good deer. Yeah. Hundred uh, percent. They got so. Also, by the way, if you just break it down by like scarcity, kind of, if you put it in like economic terms, forty uh, percent of uh, the does, or let's see, fifty percent, fifty percent of the does are being bred in peak rut. So that, I mean, that means they're being bred like they're doing the deed. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? So that there's a lot more does in estrus. But if you take, you know, that's fifty percent of them. But during that early rut time frame and late rut, it's only 20%. So they're, they're, the does are more scarce for the bucks. Like, they're having to work harder to go find them. And I think that's why you get, like, the whole lockdown thing that people talk about. Or uh, you just don't get, like, as much action during that peak rut time frame sometimes. I mean, you, it's still the rut. Like, you're still going to get action. But sometimes, I mean, those when you have, like, the craziest of the crazy hunts, it's usually early rut or late rut. Yeah. And a lot of guys will even talk about, which I don't think they really covered it in here, but a lot of guys will talk about that late rut being better for the big, big bucks. Mm -hmm. And that's typically been the case, at least the areas I'm the most familiar with. Mm -hmm. A a bunch of good deer get killed throughout the rut, but the big, big bucks get killed, like, kind of after the rut's starting to end. In some cases, like, especially growing up, you know, in this one area around here that ruts kind of early December, like that December 10th through 15th time frame is always really good. But people will kill like a giant on like the day after Christmas. Yeah, yeah. And typically that's when I've been like winding down on that place. Mm-hmm. But but that's when someone's killing just a freaking giant. And I I ran a bunch of cameras in thickets uh, a couple years ago on this uh, particular place. And that actually I was telling you this earlier. In some of these areas, I was getting I was getting really big deer like upper echelon bucks on camera. But during the rut. I mean, this is in a bedding area, like in a thicket. And during the rut, they are in there at like 1 a.m., 10.30 p.m., like mm-hmm. the middle of the night. And then after Christmas, like super late rut, after I've moved on and I'm hunting somewhere else, boom, those bucks are in there in daylight. Mm-hmm. You know, December 26th, January 1st, January 8th, you know, and it's just like way later than I'd typically hunt that area. So, yeah. uh, and I got another little now, graph here. Now, one thing you're missing what? I don't know if you noticed something about that section we just read about talking about the fifty percent and forty percent left out ten ten percent of those deer. Yeah, I know. Where, so, where's the ten percent? Yeah. So it makes me wonder, and I don't know if they highlight it in the study because I haven't read the I haven't read the study, so I'm kind of going along as the listeners and the viewers are right now, as Andrew's kind of read the study. Is it makes me wonder that ten percent is these those that just don't get bred, or they you know it, they don't um, you, you, maybe they get bred but they don't you know take on you know. How, the, how am I putting this? Maybe they're bred, but they're not like uh, positively bred or whatever. Okay, positively bred. Someone was pregnant. Sh- someone was shooting some blanks. Okay, that's what I'm trying <laughs> to get to. So, or it makes me wonder. You hear a lot of you. Well, not a lot of people. You hear some guys talk about some hunters has been on this podcast and other shows as well, talking about a secondary rut. Okay, we're like mm. not all the does get bred, and then there's other ones that come back in the heat, especially like say doe, you know, doe fawns, you know, like yearlings, stuff like that, and are bred at a later time. I wonder if that's part of this ten percent that's not being discussed in this study. Yeah, that potentially that's something that's taking place a little bit later on. Because the funny thing is, you always see people, and like here, for example, some of this public land we're talking about. I have seen like good bucks, probably three and a half year old bucks. I'm talking about on a doe, like it is their last, their their, their <laughs> last hope in the world to breed this doe, going into March. Okay. This yep. is an area that, you know, that definitely, uh, you know, a lot of those deer getting bred in, in December. Um, I don't know if that doe was hot, but he was sure acting like it, okay? Mm-hmm. Grunting up a storm and stuff, going out scouting for turkeys, and there's bucks Could chasing be. does. Could be. And it, I wonder if just because the, the timeline of when they did this study, specifically on the breeding aspect, it's not, <clears> you know, keying in on any of that. If there was any doe fawns that came to heat a little bit later on, you know, a month, two months later, um, you know, they're not really tracking that kind of activity. Yeah, for sure. Um, they got a little graph here that, that it's another little, you know, deer thought bubble and it's, uh, thinking like a buck during breeding season today, I'll evaluate breeding opportunities and eat, but here are my considerations for movement. Kind of the same thing as the last one. Uh, some areas have potential mates near estrus. Some don't. Some areas have potential mates that are far away. Some are close. Some have competition. Some don't. Some are nutrient rich. Some are nutrient poor. Some have risks and predators. Some don't. 
So kind of the same thing. And, and this whole time they're trying to maximize their breeding potential and minimize their predation risk. Uh, and then kind of in the middle of that is eat enough to live. So just eat enough to not die. Yeah. Which is why they lose so much weight, you know, this time of year. Now, another segment, you didn't, you didn't highlight this, but I find this pretty interesting. It says, bucks certainly aren't couch potatoes. During the pre-rut, they are traveling roughly, and I guess this is the average, uh, 4,800 yards or 2.7 miles per day yeah, in the pre-rut. that's interesting. And one of the reasons I wanted to go over this is because some of this stuff, like, if you're, especially if you're like a lifelong deer hunter or if you've been hunting for a while now, like, it, it's obviously, a lot of this stuff is obvious. Like, yeah, they're going to move more in the rut, but I like how they're labeling this stuff and giving you, a, like, a framework to logically think about it. Mm -hmm. um, because, like, the way that I look at this, the thinking like a buck thing is like, okay, maximize breeding potential, minimize predation risk, eat enough to live. So that gives me a framework the same way that I do the whole three reasons. Mm -hmm. So uh, we haven't talked about that in a while, but like when you're one, one thing that I started doing that helped me a lot when I was trying to, you know, figure out, especially public land was not hunting a spot unless I had three reasons to, that I was going to kill a deer right there that day during that hunt. So if you're in a spot and you're like, okay, what are my three reasons here? Like, okay, uh, super fresh sign, super fresh feed, um, and you know, whatever, like, Give yourself three reasons, and if you can only come up with one or two reasons, then move on and j and don't set up until you got that third reason. So that's like a, a logical framework that kind of forces you into a decision. Mm -hmm. And so this could be the same thing because sometimes you can just go out there and you can kind of be bumbling around and not not really, I guess, thinking about where you're hunting, like why am I hunting here? Mm -hmm. Why would a buck be here? And the re again, the reason I like this is because this gives you like a framework of like, okay, why would a buck be here? Why would a buck be doing this? And, you know, you can you can kind of look at it from that perspective. It's like, okay, what's his breeding potential here? What's his predation risk mm -hmm. here? And, uh, and you can kind of filter your decisions based on that. So I like that it gives you an actual framework, you know, and, and kind of putting the pieces of the puzzle together in your head. Um... As the number of estrus does increases during the early rut, so do buck movements increasing over 7,000 yards per day during the early rut. Total daily movement of bucks was greatest during the peak rut when, when bucks move over 7,500 yards or four miles per day. So that kind of goes right in the face of what we just said about, uh, you know, like that early rut time frame can be like really, really good. And that's like when we have the best luck. Well, this, this says that they're moving on average, more during the peak rut. So how do you take that? I mean, it, that's probably the case. But also, I'll say this. This is an area, and they mentioned this early in their study, it's a two-to-one ratio, or mm -hmm. almost one-to-one -one ratio. Yeah. Uh, where it's, you know, roughly one buck to every one to two does. Yeah. Well, there's a lot more competition, so they have to travel more. If you're in an area like some of the Ooh. public land that we hunt, that, that, be honest, don't have enough doe days. So a lot of does just don't get harvested. Yeah. And... If, if the harvest is specifically focused on bucks, which a lot of our public land, especially in Alabama, are focused on because you just don't get a lot of doe opportunities. I'm talking specifically rifle hunting, which was when majority of the deer in Alabama, I think, on public land are getting killed. You have, you might have, I'm just going to throw a number out, five to ten does per adult buck. Okay. Yep. And if that's the case, he doesn't have to travel in order to go find a mate. Yep. He doesn't have to travel four miles. Yep. Uh, because there's, you know, in, in, in a in a, a four-mile circle, there's probably, in, in some of these areas around here, 10 different doe groups in that four miles that probably have anywhere between three to eight does in them, 10 does in them. Mm -hmm. So at some point, well within four miles, he's going to find, I'm pretty certain, a hot doe, receptive doe. So that keeps them from having to travel so much. Also, I think a big factor is in an area where you have a very close buck to doe ratio, again, one to one, one to two, which is really hard to do. You got to shoot an absolute ton of does. Um, the competition is so much higher. So those bucks have to not only fight more, they have to probably be a little more aggressive in order to get breeding opportunities. But because they're having to travel, when they get done breeding one doe, they might have to travel another couple miles to go find another hot doe. Versus again, here mm -hmm. in a lot of areas that we hunt, because typically, you know, if you're seeing eight or nine does on a sit, and then you're seeing like maybe one buck, one little buck, or something like that. Yep. There's some mature bucks running around. They're just not showing themselves. But the second he's done breeding one doe, he could probably find another hot doe in that doe group or the yeah. next doe group over on the next ridge across the drainage from him. So he doesn't have to travel nearly as far when when it's so lopsided on buck to doe ratio. Yeah. And this is an interesting conversation. It'd be, it'd be fun to have with uh, like Alan Summerford with Land Legacy uh, over here in, in Hartsville, Alabama. 
about his thought process on that. You know, he's always trying to hammer does because if you if yeah. you can balance out that ratio, especially you and all your neighbors, if you have some private land, again, hard to do some public land uh, unless you're just a bow killing sob. Um, is those deer just don't have to travel as far if they have so many mm-hmm. different options. So yeah. I think that's a big difference between this. And that's why I would take a little bit of this, like this aspect here with a grain of salt, um, because, you know, if you're in an area where it's very lopsided buck to doe ratios, I don't think the bucks have to travel nearly as far. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree with that. That's a, a that's a good answer. Um, all right. This is where they take their first shot at the moon phase, people. Mm-hmm. Uh, hunters and many deer biologists claim that moon phase significantly impacts deer movements based on personal observations. When we break down our total daily movement rates into daytime and nighttime periods, we see results by moon phase are quite conclusive, just not in the way that we may have expected. Total distance traveled throughout the daytime and nighttime hours varies from day to day with greater total movement uh, during the night and during the day. However, there is absolutely no pattern of variation that can be associated with the moon phase. So, here is the problem with that, in mm-hmm. my opinion. I'm not a moon phase guy, but... M- or moon position. Well, it says phase on here, but yeah. So, when they say phase... So, yeah, so there, there's, a, there's a little bit of a disconnect here yeah. because everyone has a different opinion on this. But, like, at least when I, grow, when I was growing up, it was always moon phase. It was never moon position. Mm-hmm. So I think that's what they're trying to address here. But people would be like, okay, yep. it's a full moon. It's this, it's that. So either a full moon or a new moon. So it's going off moon illumination. And it would be during a full moon, you're going to have, it's going to be terrible because the deer were up all night running around acting crazy because they could see. During a new moon, is the opposite. It should be really good because they couldn't move as far last night because they couldn't see anything because it was so dark. Um, and basically what they're saying here is that there's absolutely no pattern, which, I mean, I think the data probably demonstrates that pretty clearly, but the argument against like kind of the claim they're making here would be some people would say like, okay, well, it's not a game of like total movement. It's a game of when they're moving, like what time of day that they're moving mm-hmm. or, and, and how, how, um, finite or how, how, uh, how fine your, your data is. So mm-hmm. Some people would say, like, okay, if the moon phase is good, then that if that gets him to move a uh, hundred more yards than he would have, fifteen minutes earlier than he would have, then that's what you're looking for, like as a bow hunter. Mm-hmm. And like, I don't think that they address that. So I don't think that I don't think it's conclusive from that perspective. I think from the new moon full moon thing, maybe. Uh, but what's your opinion? I mean, if you look at the charts here again, everybody's on YouTube. You can see this. It's all based around full moon, new moon situation. So what Andrew's talking about, he's not talking about moon posi- moon phase. We're talking about moon positioning, overhead, underfoot, um, and then also rising and setting moon, uh, which is very specific hours of a day when that all lines up. It's not like an all-day thing. Um, a lot of the more successful hunters that we've talked to, they, they don't care anything about necessarily it's a full moon new moon anything like that like maybe it kind of plays maybe a little factor form but it's more so when's the moon overhead when's the moon underfoot when is a rising moon when's the setting moon if you look at a feed chart like outdoor like alabama outdoor alabama their app uh which is what we use for our uh game check and all that kind of stuff for the state and checking in on public land they have like a feed time on there and it will show you uh like a, a major mo- movement pattern or feed time is moon overhead and underfoot the miners is a rising and setting moon okay now they don't look at that at all based off what i'm seeing here they're just looking at full moon new moon and then you know everything else in between and whether or not those actual moon phases had any you know significant impact on overall deer movement um and that's not what i'm interested in because the thing is if you don't look at those details of like those feed times that you can see in a bunch of different feed charts um, or movement charts that are all over the internet. It's not talking about like all day movement. It's movement during a certain yeah. window of time of when, you know, potentially deer are active. Uh, I've tried to pay attention to it. It's something I don't like if I see it kind of lines up where like, uh, you know, moon's going to be overhead at 7 a.m. I might get a little more excited, yeah. but I'm not going to not go to the woods if, yeah. if it didn't line up correctly. Uh, like the last couple of days, it's been like midday, you know, moon overhead. And I'm like, you know, I haven't been able to hunt a whole bunch of midday, but we had camera. Now, listen, looked at when our cameras went off. Now, this is something that's a little bit different. Um, a few days ago, uh, yeah. I think it was on Monday or Tuesday, we had a big flurry of buck movement. 
and there was a decent amount of movement 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, and that did line up with yeah. the overhead position. And it lined up at my hunting club and on a piece of public land a couple hours away from here yes. in Alabama where we have cell cameras. Like at the same time. Yeah. So, so I go back to this. That was I, interesting. I, I'll admit, that is quite interesting. So that's one thing I, I wish some of these biologists and researchers would look at that aspect. I don't care about the moon phase more moon positioning and just seeing if, if they, you know, find anything uh, of, of value there. They may not. Who knows? Um, again, I'm not a ride or die moon uh, positioning guy, but uh, I just know a lot of successful hunters that do pay attention to the moon positioning overhead underfoot. And definitely when it lines up really good with that morning movement or afternoon movement. Um, Crepuscular times. Yeah, they, they seem to have an enhanced hunt specifically in some of those spots. So Yeah, interesting stuff. So we'll uh, we'll end up going back to the moon here in a minute. Um, but yeah, it goes through some hourly movement. A lot of, a lot of graphs and stuff in oh, here that are pretty cool. I want to go to hourly movement. So this is interesting. So there's a chart here uh, talking about hourly buck movement by rut phase. Um, it's showing no rut, pre-rut, uh, peak rut, and post-rut. And one thing that's really interesting is that movement you see, especially during the pre peak and post rut between roughly eight, yeah, eight, nine, almost 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, and it kind of dies back down a little bit of move, uh, midday action around noon. And then of course it spikes around four or five o'clock at night. Hey, I'll, I'll tell you something else interesting about this chart. Check mm -hmm. this out. Average distance moved per hour is your Y axis on this chart. Average distance moved per hour in yards so this is saying like you know like 9 a.m. when it when it peaks like for peak rut 9 a.m. they're moving like 110 yards an hour. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Uh, and then you know post rut uh, probably about 90 yards an hour. That's I, I don't know. I just find that pretty intriguing. But see, it goes back to the morning movement. If you look at this, and I actually had a conversation with our buddy Jacob Emery about this earlier. I told him I'd give up four or five afternoon hunts for one morning sit because I always feel much more confident killing a buck in the morning mm -hmm. in a lot of spots versus mm -hmm. afternoon spots. And this chart actually kind of shows that, that like morning movement between 7 and 9 a.m. is higher than what you're going to have at, you know, between 3.30 and 7 o'clock in the evening. I wonder, I wonder if that's because, do you think that's because around between like, Four and six a.m. You're kind of going through twilight, gray light, and everything. Uh, it's it's starting to get more light outside, and those deer are are basically going to, like some people would say, they're going to an initial bed. This actually is going to be this is coming up in a second mm -hmm. in this study, but they go to like an initial bed, mm -hmm. and then you know later in the morning they kind of shift and they're going to a different bed, and then they're going to a different bed, maybe kind of going further back into that cover, or or working their way, kind of hopping from cover to cover, and that's why you see that increased morning movement because like by 10 or 11 in the morning they're they're finally getting to their final destination which on this graph it you know between basically 11 a.m and like 4 p.m uh, it's saying they're moving like 60 yards an hour well 60 yards in an hour i mean that could easily be them just like moving around in a little bedding area yeah you know that doesn't that's not necessarily them traveling now, i'll say this what is and i probably don't have it on here but this would drive me crazy i would I want to be a consult or consultant <laughs> for one of these studies, okay? <laughs> Why can't they have this broken down by age class of bucks that they have collared? Uh, I don't know. That's because if you have a whole bunch of one-and-a-half-year-old bucks, That's they're probably not going to be moving a whole bunch midday. Mm -hmm. But you have a couple five, six, seven, eight-year-old bucks that you have collared, and you can actually see, like, by age class, what does movement look like? Mm. Me as a hunter gets me a little more excited. That gets me a little more excited than just seeing overall buck movement. Because, again, they're probably factoring in one-and-a-half-year-old bucks to like, they got some six-year-old bucks collared. And there's a lot less six-year-old bucks than there's yeah. one-and-a-half-year-old bucks. So if that's the case, it's already going to skew the data points to kind of lean more towards a younger age class deer. Yeah, that's a good question. So that drives me up a wall a little bit because you hear a lot of guys talk about, you know, really good midday movement, especially with mature bucks. And this kind of shows a little bump in activity. But again, if you have a bunch of, you know, if we talked about earlier, like the survival rating, you know, every year you're losing, you know, 30 to 40% of that age class structure due to, you know, hunter, hunter mortality, natural mortality, all that kind of stuff. That means that the age, the more mature age class structure, say five, six year old bucks, you're going to have way less of those. So their data entry points are going to be less valuable in an overall study if you have, you know, three or four times the amount of younger bucks, say one and a half to two and a half year old bucks compared to like those five and six year old bucks. 
So it's going to already skew the data. So that, that drives me up a wall because I can, I can already tell they didn't do that. <laughs> Calling them out. Uh, and then they have some other graphs in here. Uh, this one, we, we didn't really touch on this. Um, but you can, you can go, again, read this. It's linked in the description uh, to learn about uh, total distance versus net distance, which is something that they looked at in here, meaning total distance would be like, let's say the deer moved 2,400 yards during a day. But from where he started the day and where he ended the day is 1,300 yards. So that's his net movement. So, you know, it's not like he walked from point A to point B 2,400 yards in a straight line, you know. Uh, so that's kind of taking that into account. It's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and then, all right, here we go. Focal areas. This is interesting. So this is buck bedding. This is where they're talking about basically buck bedding. Um, Focal areas are places on the landscape that deer visit repeatedly. We found that adult bucks revisit many distinct locations with varying levels of regularity throughout the hunting season. We identified these areas based on the movement characteristics of deer and determined areas where they were showing concentrated movements, and in parentheses, slower movement rates with lots of turning, like our movements at home. So you think about walking around in your house, you're doing a lot of turning, you're doing a lot of misdirect, like you know, you're walking into the kitchen, then going into the den, then going to the bedroom, then going to the bathroom. Um, uh, we do not know exactly what is holding the buck in the area. Most likely he's resting, AKA bedding. Uh, but nearly all of our adult bu bucks are showing these repetitive movements, shifting. This is, this is the interesting thing. Shifting areas frequently, 74% of them changed focal areas every six to 10 hours. So hunters should expect bucks, uh, to use many areas rather than a single sanctuary. Hunters and land managers should recognize that bucks will use multiple, multiple focal areas during hunting season. These focal areas can be scattered across the property so managers can influence buck movement by setting up travel corridors that connect nearby focal areas. What's your take on that? That's interesting. I mean, it's kind of what we've kind of talked about for a while. It's like, you know, you could have a buck use a specific bed, but he's got a bunch like in this, you know, one description with this one specific buck. Oh, figure 10, buck 227, three and a half years old. Yep. This is him December 20th through 26th, so presumably this is in the rut. Three and a half year old buck in the rut. He's got one, two, three, nine. four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, I can't count. Golly. I can't read. You can't count. <laughs> Usually that's backwards. Um, so, yeah, he's got ten different, in, a, in the span of six days, ten different focal areas. Let's see. He visited all of them. Let's say he visited one of them four times, one three times, one four times, one two times, and then the rest of them were one visits. So so he had one, two, three. He had three areas that he heavily favored, which are interesting. Where they again, if you're not if you're not watching on the YouTube video, you should go look because this is a map. These are points plotted on a map. You can see where this deer was actually hanging out. Air, aerial imagery too, so you can see like what's he the, the actual habitat, yeah. What well, does does anything uh kind of stick out to you so, about this? Yeah, the two the the two areas he used four times in this seven day period uh, are islands of cover in around uh, looks to be like agriculture. Yeah. Um, and one thing that's kind of interesting about it is all these islands of cover, these two different specific islands of cover, which are on the southern portion of this map, um, have little, probably if I had to guess, irrigation ditches running in between them and a small tree line that he's using for traveling going back and forth. So he's able to yeah. stay hidden. There's points all along that ditch where you can tell he's been traveling and, down and, that ditch to and, get to And it. this one right here that runs north to south between those two points. Going right here and right there. Yep. Better be watching on the YouTube video. Yep. So um, th I think that's a, a really big factor is like, you know, he's not just betting out on an island of cover. He's having different ways he can go back and forth in between these locations. Um, and also they're not, uh, oh, let's see, he's got a scale on here. Um, Half mile. Scale. Yeah. So, I mean, they're not, yeah, they're definitely not huge little pockets that he's, that this buck specifically using no. um, to kind of move around in, but more than likely, anytime you get like these little pockets, of trees like this, these little island trees, especially in and around agriculture, because they can get sun from almost, you know, 360 degrees around them. You're going to have a lot of thick cover typically in those little pockets, unless it's like giant mature trees, which it may be, but more than likely it's going to have a lot of brush and everything growing in it. So he's probably going to have really good security cover. There's probably going to be plenty of brows in there for him to feed on. Mm -hmm. um, but also it's an area that he can potentially, you know, depending on where he's bedded, 
he can hear or see something coming from a distance. Yeah. Um, you know, so he probably feels fairly safe in those locations. Yeah. Uh, compared to some of these other sites that he visited just one time, uh, which, you know, this is during that time period of the rut. He may be kind of just bedding in and around where some other doe groups are at and trying to keep tabs on them. Uh, and then, you know, for these other couple of visits, um, you know, he's just kind of like getting bounced around from spot to spot. Yeah, this is one that doesn't have uh, buck 273. Uh, so it's a different buck. Different buck. Doesn't have a map beneath it, but it's just kind of it's kind of showing you like his web of activity, like what that data actually ends up looking like, and how he's how he's traveling between bedding uh, areas, and and you can see like these big long arms, like those are his excursions, and the the walking would be like you're just travel. That's a green line. You can see this big long green line goes way out here, and then when it loops around, it turns blue. That's feeding or tending. Uh, so like that's where he slows it way down and, and he's kind of taking his time through there and then it turns green again and he goes whoop, back into his little home range. Man, I'm, I'm about colorblind. It was hard to tell that went from green to blue. Yeah, right here you see yep. that. Uh, so so that that's a. Uh, oh my gosh, what I do? Okay. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that that's uh that's kind of interesting. Like you can see his little clusters of beds kind mm -hmm. of all over the place and how he's how he's running through those beds and uh almost. Not so, quite like an oval pattern, but kind of kind of like a elongated shape. You know, it's not like a circle or anything like that. But he's got he's got beds kind of going. So another interesting thing about this, and I, I wish they would have done this with this buck. Uh, let's see, buck, uh, buck two seven seven yeah, two seven seven. Is I would love to see the the points of where he's traveling because to me, one thing you can learn about a lot of these GPS studies that they actually have aerial imagery, and actually not just showing you pins of where the deer are at, but showing point of travel. Uh, kind of like in this example with Buck uh, 273. Again, guys, go to YouTube so you can watch this. Um, you can kind of get an idea, at least on aerial imagery, of what this buck likes to travel through. In, in yeah. my opinion, especially if you hunt similar habitat to some of these examples, you could probably look at, you know, Onyx on your property or wherever you hunt at and potentially find similar looking corridors on your property that might would set up really good for overall buck movement. Yeah. Um, because there's definitely some takeaways like that you can get from some of these GPS studies. If it's in an area that looks similar to some, maybe some of the stuff that you hunt and you kind of can key in on some of that. Yeah. Uh, let's see the, these other graphs, time spent in behaviors, uh, during the day. So they're spending most of their time bedded during the day, obviously. So no, nothing, nothing very, surprising there again go look go look at these graphs and everything uh for yourself go pull it up it's in in the description uh daily movements of adult bucks were usually contained within an annual home range of about 860 acres annual home range of 860 acres so for the whole year he's living in roughly that on average however the tremendous amount of variation among individuals makes it difficult to state with certainty what any one buck will do the median annual home range was about 860 acres, but 27% were less than 500 acres, and 25% were greater than 2,000 acres. So that's interesting. Uh, and they get a little bit deeper into this here, uh, stating about one-third of adult bucks were mobile. So they break it down into some bucks are mobile and some bucks are sedentary. Uh, about one-third of their bucks were mobile, and had a migratory lifestyle with two distinct seasonal home ranges. For example, toward the end of August 2017, Buck 297 traveled from the northwest about two miles, or 3,500 uh, 3, yards, to his other home range, which he occupied until late January. So for hunting season, he just freaking checked out in mm -hmm. August. You know, like when everyone has that giant velvet buck on camera, and then he just freaking disappears. So he, just, he, he leaves in August. He's there till January. During the last few days of January, Buck 297 made a reverse movement along the same corridor and returned to his southeastern home range and remained there until August 2018 when he again traveled to his northwestern home range just like the year before. So August, he's like, I'm out. I'm going to... And they actually have this buck plotted out over here, which is super interesting. Now, this one is, is really interesting to me too. The other two-thirds of adult bucks were sedentary. These bucks had a single home range that they occupied throughout the year. Although sedentary bucks made excursions outside their home range, they didn't last more than a few hours. Buck 13 had a single home range area and is an example of a sedentary personality, figure 18, which is a graph uh, or, a, or a map. Uh, mobile buck home ranges averaged 12,406 acres, while sedentary bucks averaged 786 acres. Although the average distance between mobile buck home ranges was 4.4 miles, two bucks 
had some home ranges that were separated by greater than 10 miles, and one of them traveled 18 miles and crossed the Mississippi River to get to his other home range. That's pretty legit. So that's interesting um, because this is something that's come up on the podcast before about us trying to basically can on bucks during the summer, and we always kind of felt like we were fine and deer in the summertime, especially on, on public land. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then we, we were having trouble, like, like we'd lose them or, or we weren't sure if like, is it really worth it? Like you're going out there and you're getting pictures of them in July and August. Like, can this really help you? And, uh, eventually like Michael, he ended up killing that buck. He had it on camera all summer and killed it right where he had it on camera all summer mm-hmm. in, uh, in December. So, uh, we were like, okay, so they don't move like they They stay here. But what this is saying is that some of them actually do move only about one third of the bucks that they looked at. So pro- that's probably, you know, pretty representative of most deer, uh, about one third of our adult bucks were migratory. And so the other two thirds are more sedentary and they have, they have that smaller, they don't, they don't basically check out and just completely move. So their home range might vary in size, which we're going to get into a little bit deeper here in a second, but uh, two thirds of deer, they have like their kind of one home range that they that they live in, but mm-hmm. one third of them completely leave and have a completely different home range somewhere else. So that's your buck that that just breaks your heart and just absolutely disappears and then shows up randomly again. Now uh, another question I've got, <clears throat> this is why I'd love to talk to these researchers. Um, if I had to guess, this fifty thousand acre piece of pro that's got a bunch of different landowners in here is probably fairly high managed yep. property. Okay. Yep. Mm-hmm. I'm curious to see what it would look like in a very unmanaged property or, mm. or you know, say a piece of public land and the differences there. Would yeah. that still, you know, one third still be migratory and two thirds would be sedentary or would it be flip flop potentially? And, and how would that kind of factor? Cause I go back thinking like some of these guys say that are hunting, you know, some of the mountains say, you know, Appalachian mountains, not Appalachian, Appalachian. Okay. Throw an Appalachia. And, uh, you know, some of those areas, especially if there's not quality forage and, you know, maybe a bad acorn year, Mm -hmm. all those deer could become migratory at that point instead of, you know, sedentary and really kind of focus on the spot. So I wonder how much that kind differs in different areas um, with that specific, you know, um, statistic. They they kind of get into that here in a little bit. Uh, And then I got some graphs, you know, so this is like showing a buck that is, you know, it, it just, visualizes what they're talking about so he's got this one very distinct home range over here and then he's got a little trail of points going way over here to this other home range where there's just points absolutely stacked on top of each other and you compare that to more of a sedentary buck and he just he just has them all in in one spot you know they're all there's a big giant blob of points hey that that, uh sedentary buck number 13 that's how i want my my turkey pattern looking like with my tss (laughs) (laughs) um all right, response to hunting pressure. This is uh, this is pretty interesting. So, uh, bucks use bedding areas in a variety of habitat types, including bottomland deciduous forest, pine stands, and old fields. But habitat types differ from place to place. So, if you're a hunter or a manager, you're wanna, you're going to want to know the physical char- characteristics that make bedding areas distinct and more attractive from other areas on your property. Ooh, getting to the juice here. Yeah, knowing this will help you create similar features. Uh, you know on your property. Um, We compared the physical structure of two of our most heavily used areas within each buck's hunting season home range, which were likely bedding areas, to two randomly selected areas within their home range, but where they never visited. Uh, We measured screening or hiding cover based on relative visibility of a six by one foot sampling frame at a set distance from the plot center, figure 20. So what they're talking about there is basically... They've got this big board that's like black and white, like checkered black and white most of the time. And basically you say, okay, I'm going to go put this, you know, 20 feet away or or whatever the distance they choose. And you measure how much of that board is obstructed. So it, again, it's a way to measure how much cover there actually is. Um, and so that's, that's what they're using to uh, uh, measure the screening or hiding cover. Their most heavily used bedding areas had twice as much physical or structural screening screening cover than unused areas. Screening cover consists of vegetation that provides refuge to hide in and rest in, and in the case of deer, uh, a place to ruminate, a.k.a. chew their cud. In areas that adult bucks use most frequently, there was more vegetation to screen than from the site 
uh, screened from the sight of human and natural predators. Some of the screening cover could have also served as a source of food, and that is ideal from a management standpoint. But their main motivation during hunting season likely was to feel safe while resting. So, again, kind of no, no shock there. But uh, not all cover is necessarily created equal. Even though their main motivation was physical obstruction for hiding, it's even better if that physical screening cover could also provide a source of food. Our buck's cover consisted of twice as much herbaceous plants and twice as much thicket-forming vegetation that includes some important deer forages so they could also grab a bite as needed. Mr. Myers, what is your opinion on this? Dude, I'm telling you, I've been saying this for a long time. Buck's bedding in a pine thicket, okay? There's briars, there's honeysuckle, there's all kind of forage species of plants growing in that stuff, and that is exactly... Like they haven't said pine thicket. That's the first thing that came to mind. Like yeah. you got this green briar, you got honeysuckle. You have all these different forbs that are growing up in these spots that, again, physically you can't really see into, but a buck can navigate it. He can lay down. He can hear predators are coming. If anything yep. comes in, he can hear them. A lot of times he's not seeing them. And another thing that they've mentioned, just because of the screening cover, more than likely how these bucks are using it, I'm, I'm curious, I don't know, because I haven't read this study, if this is setting up more so for what we've talked about in the past in the podcast of a, I call it like a hearing based bed or a scent based bed where like they can't visually see out from their bed necessarily. Yeah. They're bedding in cover that they can't see out stuff, can't see into them, but something tries to come in there, they can hear or potentially smell it in, in some cases. hundred percent. And this is uh this, I like this cause this for me kind of, again, just kind of closes the book on, on a lot of buck bedding, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? A lot, a lot of, um, a lot of information out there that, that again may be relevant in other areas, specifically other like up north, other, other regions. But down here, you can you can go and you can find deer beds on the edge of a pine thicket, looking out from that pine thicket. But when it comes to bucks specifically, I don't think that they're using those. Like, sure, you might jump a, a buck out of one every once in a while. That that rarely ever happens to me. Mm -hmm. Very, very rarely. You might jump a deer, and th there's a lot of confirmation bias that goes into this, because I've been with a lot of different people in the woods, and I've been guilty of this myself, mm -hmm. where you hear, this buck's going to be bedded on a point with the wind at his back, looking out of the cover, watching down, and you go easing down there, and you blow a deer out, and you don't see it. You're like, that was a buck. You have no idea if that was a buck. Mm -hmm. That's a hundred percent confirmation bias, and you're complete. You're just you're you're guessing that was a mm -hmm. buck because you want it to be a buck. Yep. And and the reason I bring that up is because I f I chased my tail with that for like years, and it never really led anywhere. And then we got a hold of the Auburn GPS uh, data, which is on our Patreon, and lo and behold, like all of the all the focal areas, exactly what they looked at on here, we did that on our own thing. All of those daytime focal areas are like in the cover. They're not on the edge of the cover. Mm -hmm. They're in it. They're 40, 50 yards into that cover, sometimes right smack in the middle of it. Uh, and this goes into their, they kind of label it here, their main uh, motivator is visual obstruction. Mm -hmm. So exactly like what you're talking about, they just want to be back in that secure, really thick cover where like something can't charge them basically. You know, something can't run in there and get them. They can't be seen. Like they want to be, like visually hidden and they're going to use their senses to detect whatever comes in there. Cause it, you're not getting in there quietly. And I think that's a difference between what a lot of the Southern hunters deal with compared to more of the guys in the Midwest where maybe like their thick cover because the winters are so harsh, like you're not going to have green buyer and stuff like this still yeah. like leafed out in, you know, December, January. Yeah. Like it's going to be a lot more dead in the woods. So a lot of those, like the, the more um, higher stem count grassy, shrub type plants that are still will hold leaves and a lot of that kind of stuff down the uh, in the fall and the winter time down here yeah they don't have that up there necessarily so those bucks i would think in that situation would probably have to bed more so with a visual that just naturally would bed with a more visual uh advantage right like down here i think it's all based around sight i don't think it really matters a whole bunch about you know scent capability they just want to be able to hear if something's coming and then when they get mm -hmm. up out of their bed you know, they'll kind of do their little loot coming out of that bed, J-hook out of that bed in order to kind of scent check, you know, whatever they can smell. Yeah. But it's all based around, I, I believe, it's all based around, you know, what can they hear, you yeah. know. And also different conditions. Now, one thing about this, they, they don't give us like a really good, I don't, maybe they do have a really good map of this whole property on here. I don't know how much logging is taking place on this property because, mm -hmm. again, a lot of this looks like it's kind of a little mixed agriculture, kind of like river bottom pine plantation and stuff like that. Now, if there's pines, 
in pine plantations, there's, they've been cut at some point. Yeah. So there's, yeah. There's probably clear cuts in mixing around. Yeah, it, it does mention there's like loblolly, commercial loblolly stands. Well, one thing that kind of goes, if, you, if you're not in like one of these areas where we talk about pine thickets where, you know, you have this visual obstruction, this clear cut, a buck can get 40 yards up in it. You know, he can hear anything coming, but he's like extremely well protected. He can exit out a bunch of different ways. If you're in like a hardwood river bottom or more like, you know, up, or, you know, lowland hardwoods, you know, if you have switch cane, switch mm-hmm. cane is the exact same thing. Now, I don't know, I don't think the deer eat switch cane a yeah. whole bunch, but there could be other brow species where they can bed down these switch cane thickets, which is our natural cane. It's not a bamboo. But well, a, but a lot of those switch cane thickets are growing in like oak bottoms. Mm-hmm. And so you've got acorns dropping right into them. It, it, exactly. Especially if it's a good acorn year. So I said acorn. Yeah, right? got Ac- it. Acorn. <laughs> I got, I got to hold my ground. Um, but the switch cane can act exactly the same at, for a uh, someone that's hunting in like river bottoms. Or yeah. if you have switch cane, it's a visual obstruction. You can't see into it, especially if it's real thick, you know, five, six foot tall. Um, and if you walk through it, it is super, super loud. But yes. a deer can bet, a buck can bet in that, hear anything around him, probably still smell some stuff around him because that wind's probably swirling down those bottoms. And then he can come out of there whenever he needs to, and he has plenty of exit routes as well. Yeah, definitely. And and this again goes all the way back to the very beginning of this, where we talked about how how a deer thinks, like their incentives for where they're bedding, where they're moving, you know, where they live, and and how they're they're instinctual and they're they're subconsciously reacting. They're not consciously acting. Uh, that this goes into that because they're they're looking for something that's the most secure that has food in it. And so, like, it doesn't make any sense if there's like a, you know. I don't know, something that, that for whatever reason, like a bedding points above a parking lot or whatever, like there might be a deer there for sure. There might be beds there. You probably go there and find beds. But like where they're legitimately spending their daylight time is usually in these areas. And and so like there, again, I just, I think it's important to stress that the deer aren't thinking about it. That deer is not in that thicket. And he's like, man, if I just move like 10 yards over there, maybe I get the thermals right. And then also the wind's coming over my back. Uh, and then if I get right here, then, you know, if someone steps over that log, I can hear it. The, like, dude, he, he's a freaking animal. Like, he's just going up in that thicket and laying down, mm-hmm. you know, and he's, and he's in there because y- you can't see into it and there's food in it. Mm-hmm. And so, again, this gives a, you a framework. And, again, that's something I think is very specific to the southeast is you don't have – even if you're in ag country per se, there's still going to be some kind of browse species. If you're in the, the deep south especially, where like, yeah. we don't have harsh winters, there's going to be something for them to eat on, which, I, again, I think that's a big difference between us and the upper Midwest or a lot of the Midwest. Where, like, they yeah. have, again, harsh enough winters, unless they're eating woody browse, there's not a whole bunch for them at that point. So they're going to destination food sources, whether it's ag fields, whether it's giant food plots, whatever it is. And I think that's a big difference down here that stifles movement even more so because the bucks don't have to leave the bedding area to go feed if they don't want to. 100%. So, like, again, it goes back to, like, when we talked about earlier in this podcast, in Alabama, on some of these public land pieces, when they have a three-day gun hunt, if it's not during the rut and the buck's not going up checking for does or chasing does, if he doesn't feel like he needs to leave that bedding area, he doesn't have to because he's got all the food he needs in that general area. Yeah. And that's what makes it so hard in order to get a visual uh, observation of a buck or even get an opportunity at them because they're bedding in areas that have food for them. Like yep. they don't have to leave. And again, going back to the Auburn data, when we looked at those focal areas, those bedding areas, you'd have pins all within like a 40 yard circle of that bedding thicket, mm-hmm. but you could be a hundred yards from them and you would never see that deer because he's not coming out of that thick stuff. He's just yeah. feeding in that thick stuff right there and then laying right back down. Yeah. hundred uh, percent. All right. Here's a here's a little uh, visual example of what they're talking about with the sampling frame. So again, it's a it's a black and white board, uh, and and exhibit A. He's in the I guess that's probably bottomland uh, hardwoods. It looks like a bottomland hardwood forest, and it is uh it is just wide open. I mean, it's just a dude standing there with a big old board. Okay, either if that board's six foot tall, that's a short guy. <laughs> and then uh and then we got man, don't be hating. And then we got exhibit B. The guy is the same distance from the from the camera with the board, and you can I mean just barely barely see the board well, through the cover. Let's be honest here; it's not that, that, that's no 4K photo. That's no high def photo. Right yeah, but too. you get I mean, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but so, yeah, it, you, there's a lot more obstruction. Yeah. Uh, figure 21: Adult bucks seek out places to hide to avoid being harvested. Structural screening cover was twice as great in bedding sites than uh, in unused areas within their hunting season. So, okay. Um, and then so this get this starts going a little bit deeper into uh hunting pressure. What is this stuff? top what is this top figure real quick? 
Th- this is a theoret- uh, theoretical example of how an adu- adult buck's uh, home range changed to avoid tree stands hunted in the past five days. Ooh. Both home ranges cover the same amount of area, but the shape of the home range is right on the right is more complex with clear avoidance of space near hunted stands. So we're we're about to get into that. Okay, listen, guys, you better go to YouTube so you can see all this stuff. I'm telling you. Very, very, very interesting. We looked to see if adult bucks were changing the size and or shape of their home ranges in response to increased risk from hunters on the landscape. Uh, and basically, uh, they found that they did not uh, do that. There are two possible reasons why adult bucks did not alter their daily home range in response to hunting. Uh, first, there was not enough hunting pressure to cause a change in home range size or complexity. It is also possible that the adult bucks already had the hunters figured out, and so bucks excluded hunters from their daily home range. That could be true, too. Now, listen. I think there's a difference between a very high-managed piece of private land, probably not a lot of guys hunting it, if I had guessed. There might be some hunting clubs on here, but it's probably mm-hmm. real select pressure. Yeah. Versus if you're at your own hunting club and there's you know 25 members and it's 1,800 acres, okay, 2,000 yep. acres, and everybody is just pounding it Saturday and Sunday. Okay? Oh, yeah. Now, I will say this, and we've seen this a lot, and we've had guests on the podcast talk about this, specifically Kevin Tolis, uh, who's been on the podcast a few times talking about uh, his success he had at hunting clubs. When it mentioned right here that it's also possible the adult bucks already have the hunters figured out, that can be extremely true, especially on hunting clubs, when there are designated food plots, uh, pop-up blinds, uh, you know, shooting houses, uh, ladder stands that guys continuously hunt throughout the whole season. It just takes one time for one of these bucks to encounter you from downwind or get like a negative reaction to then start skirting around that and scent checking that little area. Um, and, and to me, this kind of comes back to the advantage going back to being like more mobile hunting where they're using a saddle, lock on climber and not always hunting the same spot, but constantly kind of like if you have a certain area you're focusing on, always try to change a little bit different position so that you're not always sitting the exact same tree where, you know, a deer after, you know, one or two negative encounters can start sit checking you, which is what's being shown on this uh, diagram here. Yeah. And I, uh, just to go a little bit deeper, uh, um, if the bucks are not changing the size, they could change how complex the shape of their home range is. In this case, if prey alter their behavior within their home range to mitigate risk, then traversing a larger area or having a larger home range size does not necessarily expose the animal to increased risk. Uh, deer might respond to acute risk on the landscape by changing the size and or complexity of their home range. More complex home ranges did not confer risk avoidance, and this pattern held uh, for all phases of the breeding season. Also, the home range size and complexity were similar across all different age classes of bucks in our study. So that's what they're saying here. Like this graph up here, this theoretical example, there's, I think they're saying that did not hold water. Am, am, am I getting that right? Like mm-hmm. that's not really how it worked out. Yeah, they just kind of moved through. Uh, now, I will say this. I want to go back to an episode we do with uh, Dr. Mike Chamberlain uh, talking about um, uh, a buck specifically that they had collared. I think it was a property in Louisiana, a uh, six and a half year old buck, really big deer that all these hunters on this hunting club, this big lease thought this buck was uh, not living on the property. It was only showing up like two o'clock in the morning on cameras. They had bait sites all over the place. And a kid, one of the hunters, uh, sons kill that buck in a random spot that nobody else wanted to hunt. You know, kind of going to gar hole the kid, let him sit in this random spot in the wood, and the kid shot it. And once they killed the deer, they were able to pull the data off that collar and see specifically how this buck was moving in and around these guys' property. Yeah. In and around their stand locations, within 200 yards of their stand locations, but he was always, from what I remember in the conversation with Dr. Chamberlain, was saying, he would downwind check a lot of these locations. Like he wasn't going to food pots. He wasn't going to corn piles. He was kind of staying downwind of all that kind of stuff and just meandering through the property. But he was living there the whole time. But these guys just randomly would get them on camera during a couple of weeks out of the year during the rut. And they just thought the buck wasn't living on the property. He was living there almost year round. Yeah, 100%. So we're going to dive into hunter activity here. So they actually do describe how the hunters were using this property and the amount of pressure they're putting on it. And essentially, wait, what? No, keep going. Okay. Uh, preference for hunt locations will obviously change from hunter to hunter and with available vegetation types, uh, blah, 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 documented deer preferences for vegetation types. Uh, we took it a step further. Hunters certainly use stands in the natural vegetation, i.e. the, the hardwoods, um, but not nearly as often as the modified habitats. 
Compared to the selection for natural areas, hunter selection was two times greater for locations with feeders, five times greater with locations for summer food plots, and nine times greater for locations with winter food plots. So basically, everybody's hunting feeders, food plots. <laughs> uh, of course you're, yeah. Yeah, the, the choice to hunt over food plots and feeders makes sense because da 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 uh, This means that areas in and around food plots and feeders would be the greatest risk of uh, for deer during the hunting season. These preferences may not be surprising to hunters in the southeast, but wait until we compare hunter preferences with the preferences of our adult bucks. All right, let's dig in. All right. Deer can adjust behavior quickly within a few days to significant hunting activity. An MSU Deer Lab study in Oklahoma showed that deer increased their daytime use of cover by 240% by the second weekend of gun season. Their behavior shift produced positive effects for them. Hunter observations of collared bucks known to be in the hunted areas declined by 62% by the second weekend. Deer selection of the natural habitats in our Mississippi study area showed a striking pattern with hunting pressure or risk. During the lowest risk days when bucks, when, uh, fewest num- when the fewest number of hunters were afield, the bucks were choosing upland deciduous, pine, herbaceous, and bottomland areas at greater rates, so essentially open woods, uh, than uh, when days of higher risk. As the risk of harvest increased from low to moderate and from moderate to high, adult bucks chose the habitat less and less. And they demonstrate in figure 24. Uh, Agricultural crop areas were also used on low-risk days, but were avoided on high-risk days. These patterns suggest strongly that adult bucks minimize their use of areas with heavier hunting pressure. There is even a tipping point for hunting risk above which adult bucks choose to not be in the areas with greater risk. So let's look at this diagram real quick. So this is something interesting. This goes back to what I was going to bring up before we started reading this. That's why I wanted you to keep going. That, and, and I'm glad this kind of like pro- not really pro- it kind of proves the point I was going to make is the difference between like a low pressure hunted hunting lease. Yes. That maybe one or two people are hunting. You know, a couple thousand acres versus a, a hunting club where there's a bunch of members and all their family members hunting out there, or like for us public land or yep. in your hunting club, where like you have very specific times of the year when there is a massive increase of hunting pressure and yeah. it's like it's a light switch turns off again some people will still kill really good bucks but a lot of times with those best bucks are getting killed especially as you start getting into multiple gun hunts on a property yeah first gun hunt there's guys that kill them in hardwood bottoms uh-huh. wide open timber okay yep. after that happens they don't get killed there very often okay <laughs> and and it's like you see and we've seen this with trail cameras that like during those hunts when that when that hunting pressure ramps up for three days these deer get sucked right in tight of these like pine thickets specifically. Okay. And yep. then afterwards you start seeing them on trail camera going through open woods, uh, much more, um, like when that hunting pressure dies off, like you see them using areas that like you wouldn't previously thought they'd be in because of the hunting pressure. And we've talked about them for years on the podcast. That's something that we visually have seen yeah. and have thought about. And it's interesting that they're actually showing this in a study that that is the actual case. Uh, especially when you're starting to talk about, uh, gun hunting pressure. Cause typically I don't know about you, but I personally know people that in Alabama are like, oh, I can't wait for deer season to start. It'll be like October 30th. And I'm yeah. like, what are you talking about? Like, oh, no- November 19th, man. I can't wait for deer season to start because yeah. all they do is gun hunt. Yep. And you have a lot of people in the southeast that don't really bow hunt a whole bunch. They gun hunt more than they bow hunt or they don't even bow hunt at all. So you have so many more hunters in the woods during gun season, and especially on like a hunting club when most of your pressure is going to come in on a Saturday or maybe a Sunday it's going to potentially change movement compared if you could go out there on mm. a Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday and hunt. Yeah, 100%. Uh, and so, that, yeah, that graph that you're looking at is hunter habitat selection. And uh, basically, people are just hunting the piss out of all their food plots and a little bit on the feeders. Andrew's Hunting Club, if we could do a study on Andrew's Hunting this Club. This is it. Dude, it would be 19% higher on winter food plots. 100%. It is, like, ridiculous the amount of people, which, again, you can kill good deer on a food plot. But there, I think there's a there's a strategy to it. Okay. There really is. Yeah. Um, and like timing and, and, and how you go about hunting like a food plot specifically. But if that's all you're hunting, you're putting so much pressure on a food plot. The bucks don't have to be on the food plot. They could be a hundred yards in the woods scent checking that food plot, which goes back to the episode we did with Kevin Tolis, where when he'd be in a hunting club, he wouldn't hunt a food plot. He'd get in between the two food plots and focus on those specific areas and then capitalize on that movement again, in and around the food plot, but not actually hunt the food plot itself, and it worked extremely well for them. All right. So uh, these two graphs here, deer habitat selection, uh, this just kind of goes over uh, upland hardwoods, pine, herbaceous, 
bottom on hardwoods, summer food plots, winter food plots, feeders, crop. Uh, kind of shows you which ones they're selecting for on low risk, middle risk, and high risk days. Um, let's see. Deer habitat selection, day versus night. So, obviously, no surprise here that they're s selecting food plots super hard at night. Uh, and then their uh, bottomland hardwoods, they're selecting a little bit better during the day. That's kind of interesting. Um, all right. Food plot visitation, taking a closer look at when adult bucks chose to be in food plots. You can see the variation in visitation rates during each hour of the day. Uh, adult bucks visit food plots primarily at night with the lowest visitation rates during daylight hours. The general pattern is consistent with what we know about habitat selection by adult bucks. Adult bucks enter food plots at greater rates right around sunset, so the best opportunity for a daylight shot at these animals is hunting them along travel corridors between daytime bedding sites and these feeding locations. Yep. No surprise. No surprise. So now it's kind of getting into some of the final thoughts of, uh, of the paper. Uh, basically, some, some big takeaways. Different personalities displayed by adult bucks can help hunters understand why some pattern bucks seem to disappear. Hunters should attempt to pattern several... Uh, to increase the chance that one or more has a sedentary personality. These are more likely to be present throughout the hunting season. Uh, some bucks have a mobile personality, which means their home range shifts before or during season. Take note of when a buck starts using your property because next year he will probably be on your property about the same date. So that goes back into annual patterns, which we've been talking about a bunch here lately. Uh, adult bucks use... Many more daylight daytime bedding sites than you might have thought. Managers can manipulate vegetation to produce bedding sites that contain hiding cover that is also potential forage. Hunters should scout their land to uh, locate potential bedding sites, which can inform hunting site selection across your property. So basically, uh, kind of like what we've been saying, dude, is like they, these bucks, they got a bunch of different bedding areas that they're using um, within their home range, but the does are also going to have different bedding sites. So go figure out like what has the best visual obstruction and the best forage pine thickets are going to be it, but not, not all pine thickets. Like you got to go look at the thing because if it's, if it's aged out underneath, like if, if your pines are tall enough that when you go look under there, there's really nothing green. It's like a bunch of dead briars mm -hmm. and, and pine straw. It's still thick, but no, nothing is like alive, yeah. you know, it's shaded out and now everything's kind of dead underneath, but you still have that standing structure that that's fine from a cover perspective. But if next door you've got one that's like that, but it hasn't shaded out yet. And all that stuff underneath is still alive. You got the honeysuckle, the jasmine, the green briar, everything is, is living and green and they can forage. That's going to be better than the other one. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So again, this is giving you a framework, like a very defined stuff that you can go out there and say, okay, this is better than that for this reason. Mm -hmm. And you can go out there and kind of think of it logically from that perspective. Locate a bunch of those and then go locate the the best, safest way to get between all of them. Path of least resistance, that's the safest, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So, okay, bedding area. Here's four different bedding areas on my property that, that deer, they look really good. I've confirmed that deer are using them. All right, where are the terrain features between all of these? that are going to cover deer where they're going to avoid the most of the hunting pressure. Mm -hmm. You know, like my club is again, a great example of this because people are just hunting those food plots. So these deer will walk through some pretty open stuff because nobody hunts it mm -hmm. on the WMAs and, and national forests that we hunt. Not so much. No, not so much. You're looking for like a thick corridor mm -hmm. between the two. Um, um, Okay, they take one lat. They take a parting shot at the moon again. <laughs> Enjoy your hunt whenever you have the time to be a field. Don't worry about the moon phase when planning days to hunt, as our results show no effect. However, to maximize observation rate of mature bucks, make sure you plan time in the woods during the peak rut. Go, boom, awesome, boom. So, uh, so yeah, again, you can go and find this uh, in the description. I linked it down there. Of course, you can go watch it on the YouTube video to kind of follow along. Uh, but what, what was, the, I guess, what were some of your biggest takeaways? Well, there's some confirmation on thought process around hunting pressure and, and how much more those yeah. bucks will select for that cover during those high-pressure days. Yeah. Um, and, and more than likely, I mean, kind of my understanding from just what you've read is they're not necessarily leaving that cover all that much. Like they're staying in it um, during a lot of the day and, and then kind of moving outside. Now, I am curious, you know, is that just a general 
understanding or is that also you know something they see around the rut as well like is that at all points of the season or does the rut change that a little bit more uh, i would love to get some more in-depth context on that well, maybe we can get these these guys on uh sometime in the off season that's kind of what i'm hoping um mm-hmm. i don't know if they'll listen to this or not but i would love to to sit down and kind of step through this with them uh either whoever compiled this or some of the researchers but like you know that's just really interesting to me like during the lowest risk days when the fewest number of hunters were afield the bucks were choosing basically the the areas where they're more likely to get shot and it's just again it's just great confirmation like you're talking about i mean the thing the oklahoma thing uh in oklahoma showed that they increased their daytime use of cover by 240 percent so all that to say that when the pressure is really low like they will bed out in the open they're not they don't just live in the thickets a hundred percent of the time when the pressure gets high we're we're you got to remember we're talking about this from like a mostly public land guy perspective. Mm-hmm. And the biggest difference that I've seen between private and public land, like a hunting club versus WMAs, is on public, like you guys are in the woods. They're hunting the woods. They're going and hunting. They're using woodsmanship. Ain't nobody doing that in my club, man. Which is funny because, and I've talked to some individuals, they've mentioned this, because so many people are so focused on getting away from the food plots and everything, you can actually kill really good deer on food plots on public land. A hundred percent. It's completely backwards it's on backwards. public. I've seen some nice, nice bucks on public, and we know people who've killed hundred forty inch deer on food plots on, on food public plots. lands. And uh, yeah, so that's just that goes to show that it just depends on where your your hunting pressure is yeah. at. So, like we we're so focused on the pine thickets, and we're so focused on like, hey, these deer are in the freaking pine thickets, like they live in that thick stuff, because that's what we're used to. But if you're you know, we've had a couple of people writing in with like, you know, like the guy from our last Q and A who had 120 acres. Like, if your 120 acres is like, like very, very low pressure, like that deer could just walk through some open stuff. You know. And I want to clarify something. When it said you, you just mentioned that uh, in this Oklahoma study that their use of daylight cover increased by 240 percent. That's not their bedding in necessarily that cover. They're they're traveling and staying yes. in that cover throughout the day. So yes. just clarification. It's not like they're just bedding in it the whole time. They're just they're staying and moving in that dip, more dense cover than more in the open woods. To per, yes, hundred um, percent. I would love to break this down. They're talking about deer moving like you know seven thousand yards a day or whatever. I would be very curious of how that breaks down into just daylight hours. Absolutely. Know? Uh, and they have it because they have the data points. They, just didn't they have it. I, I know they have it. All right, Bronson Strickland, where are you at? <laughs> right, see, see does he, they got names on here about who did this study? Yeah, Bronson Strickland. All right, all right. Uh, uh, Steve Damaris, um, Rebecca Kane, Ashley Chance. Yeah, we, we need Colby Henderson. We need, uh, give, give a shout out to all these people. We'll see who. Can all right, Bronson out. Strickland, uh, Steve Damaris, Rebecca Kane, Ashley Chance, Colby Henderson, Garrett Street. Uh, Luke Res- Resop, William McKinley. Uh, appreciate you guys putting this together, man. This is fantastic, and y'all did a really, really good job with it, for real. Uh, super helpful, super digestible. And a shout-out to you guys. We'd love to get a couple of y'all on the podcast to talk do, a little I, bit more about Let's do a roundtable, man. We'll come to Mississippi State. We'll drive on over to Stark Vegas, talk to y'all. Yeah, because I, I would love to dive into this even even more so. Where some of those, I want to talk to some of the grad students who've been going over some of the data. And yeah. like, all right, listen, you need to pull some more of the daylight activity on this stuff. Um, Man, and, I just, and also, I want to see it broken down. They they have to have the details on like the age structure of the bucks that were collared. Yeah. And I want to see the upper tier. Like, let's weed out the two and a half and three and a half year olds and the one and a half year olds. Let's look at four and a half and older. Yeah. And seeing how similar or how different it is. Because again, you're going to have less four year olds. Four and a half year olds and three year olds. You're yeah. gonna have less four and a half year olds, or you're gonna have more four and a half year olds than five and a half year olds. You're gonna have more five and a half year olds than six and a half year, old, year olds. And I'm interested in that upper tier, of, you know, four and a half to six and a half, of what those deer did compared to these, you know, this, you know, general study of you know these bucks. In yeah. adult bucks, I want to see what they classify as that because I think it's probably two and a half year old or older. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. It probably does say at the top. I don't. I don't think it's two and a half. It's it's most likely three and a half and older. Uh, I'd have to. We'd have to scan through here, but I've seen other stuff that they do, and they never, I've never seen anybody include a two and a half as an adult buck. Okay. So it's most likely going to be your three and a half buck, uh, three and a half year olds uh, and older. So, anyways, uh, go download this, go read it. We left a lot of stuff out. There's a lot of really, really good details in there that you can go key in on. Uh, but again, just food for thought. Uh, like I said, I'm gonna I'm gonna beat the dead horse. Like it's a framework that you can now apply. So think of this like that. You're like, well, they move more in the rut. Duh. 
well, yeah, but th- this gives you like a way of thinking about it, you know, where you can logically apply it and, you know, not just kind of go and throw darts at the board, but you can actually say, does this meet this, this, and this criteria, mm-hmm. you know, for your area? So, uh, that's it. Cause, cause I mean, we got a, we got one of the areas that we're hunting right now, more of our big wood settings. It is not thick like what we're normally used to hunting. Mm-hmm. Uh, these deer are walking around in wide open woods cause absolutely nobody hunts it except us mm-hmm. for the most part. Um, and there's not a lot of like that herbaceous, uh, or like pine thicket type cover. There's no pine thickets there. So, th- but I still see a lot of this kind of, um, holding true to that area mm-hmm. as well. So again, you're using that framework, like, okay, what area does he have the best forage that he doesn't have to go as far for? What area do these does have the best forage that they don't have to go far for? Um, stuff like that. So, yep. so anything else? No, it's pretty awesome stuff. Hopefully we can get some of these researchers on, biologists on to do a yeah. little round table, a little more in-depth breakdown uh, of this study and some more studies. So I well, appreciate you guys watching. Cause again, if you watch this, you got a lot more out of it than just the audio listeners. If you're an audio listener, go over to YouTube, go watch this episode. I promise you, you'll get even more out of it. Um, and just appreciate y'all again, watching, listening to the podcast, appreciate y'all sharing the podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, share it with a couple buddies. Maybe it'll uh, help them out. Maybe, you know, if, if you're in a hunting club, maybe I wouldn't share this with a bunch of your other hunting club members. <laughs> I always say that, but, uh, you know, if you're hunting some public land or maybe you got a buddy that's in a different hunting club, send this episode over and maybe it'll help him out as well. Um, but again, appreciate y'all watching. Appreciate y'all listening. Appreciate everybody buying all the Southern Outdoors and merch and, uh, listen guys, we'll have to catch you back on the next episode from the Southern Outdoors and podcast. And remember guys, y'all stay Southern.